cell transfer therapy. So it basically cancer immunotherapy has uh, um, enhanced, enhancing our immune system ability to fight cancer. And this field has been increasing uh, their presence in the mainstream oncology treatment um, due to the fact that they're able to kind of reprogram our immune cells to uh, increase the recognition to the tumor cells in order to kill them. So although there's many aspects of uh, procedures that's using vaccine therapy or antibody therapy, immune checkpoints, um, we will be focusing on the ACT or the uh, adoptive cell transfer therapy uh, today. So there's basically major, uh, major three major therapeutic approaches that are considered part of the uh, adaptive cell transfer therapies. The first one is tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Second one is the chimeric antigen receptor or CAR. And then the third one is using T cell receptor. So the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are usually uh, uh, can be engineered with a tumor cell a receptor and put it back into the patient. So first, uh, T cells are isolated from the human body. Then we will use a viral vector to uh, that uh, expressing specific tumor uh, TCR. Then we will engineer this onto the human T cell, expand the T cell culture, then put them back into the patient. The second example is using CAR T. Uh, basically, you would genetically engineer the uh, uh, antigen receptor, then using uh, electroporation to uh, uh, express the uh, receptor onto the human T cell, then put them back into the uh, patient. Then finally, we have uh, immunization of mice with uh, tumor antigen, then isolate the T cell specific uh, MHC class 1 restricted tumor antigens and clone them, uh, and then finally engineer them onto the human T cells to express the TCR and put them back to, into the patient. So these are uh, three common ways that the T cells are engineered to um, express. Uh, antigens that, uh, sorry, express the receptor that would recognize the tumor in order to kill the tumor cells. So this circular process shows uh, the patient selection, isolation of cancer peptide, generation of receptor plasmid, viral vector development, isolation of PBMC T cells, transduction of the T cells expansion, functionality testing back to the patient. So we, we are going to be looking at different examples uh, in these steps. The one that's circled with uh, a red outline, we'll be looking at how uh, each step requires actual measurement of cell count viability. So in this, in, in this slide, we're looking at some common cell types that's used uh, or collected from human or mice uh, to, uh, to look at primary or purified or clinical samples. And we'll be looking at what the cells look like and what do we do to measure them. So some cell types are very difficult to count due to the variation in the different type of cells. So in this case, we're looking at A549 and also CAKI-1. Uh, um, so these two cell types shows a variation in morphology. So for example, in the CAK I1, um, there's some cells are big, some cells are small. Um, for the A549, they're very clumpy. So, which makes it very uh, difficult to count in using something like tripen blue and hemocytometer. Um, even using uh, automated cell counters, some of these variations um, can also prove to be difficult. We can also look at um, different type of samples where you have a clean jacast sample that's cell cultured. You can also have PBMCs that's collected from the patient, or you can have whole blood. So you can see the variation in the cell environment for all three samples. In this case, it would be better to use a fluorescent detection in order to easily pick out the target cells that you're trying to count. So 
with cell cultures that have minimum cell debris, then in this case, it's only uh, the target cells that's in the in the image. It can be easily counted with trypan blue assay, and this has been routinely analyzed by both a manual counting using chemistometer or automated cell counter, because there's no debris or uh, under non-specific particle that's in the in in the sample. So for more complex sample like what we saw earlier with the jacket and the PBMC, uh, manual counting is definitely very difficult to, to do with these uh, these type of samples to measure the concentration and the viability because there's unwanted um, cell 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 type or cell debris. So you can see here there's a red arrow pointing to the uh, red blood cell, which is what we don't want, um, and also some platelets. And this can lead to inaccurate cell count and viability measurement. Usually there's an extra step where you have to do lysing, uh, but that's again that's another step which can also affect the cell the cell itself. So by using fluorescent staining of primary cells, we can uh, perform more consistent and accurate cell count. So if you look at this sample, this is a fresh human leuco pack. And you can see there's a lot of different type of cells that's in the bright field. There's platelets, there's red blood cells, uh, very hard to count manually. But by doing uh, uh, acridine orange and propidium iodide staining, we will only uh, be able to label the nucleated cells uh, with live and dead um, colors. So the green represents the life and the red color represents the dead. So this allow us, allows us to uh, actually uh, measure the cell count and viability. So if we were able, if we were to do this using hematometer, um, there would be a high degree of uncertainty uh, that the sample would have due to the uh, due to all the uh, debris and unwanted cells. So we're going to uh, see some examples of the different type of cells that we are able to use the solometer to count during the process of ACT development. So the first one we're gonna see is the uh, human melanoma digest sample. So these are samples, cancer uh, tumor samples that's collected from the patient. And basically what you do at this step is you can isolate the tumor cells and then look for antigen specific uh, receptors or uh, the antigen presenting uh, uh, antibody on the, on the tumor. So in this case, we will isolate the uh, first the tumor infiltrate lymphocytes and um, and digest the tumor sample and you can use the solometer to measure the viability and concentration of the tails or the tumor itself so in this case we stained the cells with ALPI and you can see the uh, brightly stained red and the green color and we're able to count those samples the next one is uh, collecting human PBMCs or PBLs uh, so these are collecting the peripheral blood lymphocytes, and uh, after uh, uh, after separation using leukophoresis or FICO, you're able to use the solometer to measure the stained AOPI stained uh, PBMCs. The next example is looking at mouse splenocytes. So these are basically immunizing mouse with the tumor specific antigen, and we will harvest the mouse serum and the splenocytes for B cell or T cell isolation. Then again, we can use the solometer to measure the concentration of and viability of the AOPI stained uh, splenocytes. Um, in this example, uh, we were using the solometer to measure uh, the cell viability of isolated T cells. So this one, because it's isolated, the sample is very clean. So we were able to use just a bright field cell counter uh, and stain with tripan blue to uh, uh, measure the uh, measure the concentration and the viability. So we can do this before and after cryopreservation. We can do this during transdu uh, for transduction measurement. We can also do this uh, during cell expansion and also for plating. So this is a publication that was uh, published in Cancer Research. Um, they were using the solometer, uh, auto T4, to measure CAR T cell expansion. So in this uh, in this graph, we're looking at a co-culture uh, of um, the CAR T cells with K562 
um, that is uh, supplemented with IL2 or IL2, uh, IL2-1. So we wanted, they wanted to see what's the difference in cell proliferation if you have different uh, 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 stimulator that's in the, in the media to allow more heart T cell expansion. So as you can see in this example, the IL-2 and IL-2-1 combination allowed more CAR T cells to, to grow over a 28-day culture. So the salometer can also be used to count cells before plating cells for viral vector production. So in this example, we're looking at HEC-293 cells that stain with trypan blue, and then we can use the uh, salometer auto T4 to count the number of cells before uh, before plating to make sure the number of cells plated is correct. Next, you can further use the fluorescence capability to look at the GFP uh, positive cells to look at the transduction frequency. So in this case, we have sample one, sample two, and the control. So the sample one, we were able to count the total cells in a bright field, and then also the G number of GFP positive cells in the fluorescence. Then we would use the, the numbers that's generated to measure the percent transduction to see how effective the transduction was for the, um, for the therapy. Then in this, in this slide, we're looking at different cell types um, that would require different type of viability detection methods. So for example, if you have very clean samples, such as T cells for expansion or HEC293 or, um, or just feeder cells such as K562, those are very clean samples and you can use Tripan Blue. Um, if you have very mixed populations or uh, very complex samples such as tumor digest, uh, uh, fresh splenocytes, uh, uh, splenocytes after RBC lysis or PBMC or fresh PBMC, then those can be used uh, with AOPI to specifically look at nucleated cells that stain with AO or PI to look at cell count and viability. So all of the salometers instrument can perform uh, automated counting of tripan blue stained cells in bright field. Um, there are some models called Auto 2000, Vision, and K2 that allows fluorescence detection of AOPI stain. So the last example I want to show is using salometer to do functional testing of a direct NK cell mediated cytotoxicity assay. So in this experiment we did, uh, it's also published in the uh, journal PLOS ONE. Um, so what we did is we have NK cells and we also have K562 cells that's calcium AM stain. And we co-culture them for four hours at different E to T ratio or effector to target ratio at 2.2 2 to 1, 1 to 1, and 0.5 to 1. So after four hours, we're able to measure the uh, amount of live K562 cells that's left in the, uh, in, the, in the sample to determine what would be the cytotoxicity of the, uh, of the, uh, the co-culture. So, in these images, we're looking at the spontaneous uh, sample, which means there's no, uh, there's no NK cells that's added. We look at the 0.5 to 1, 1 to 1, and 2 to 1 uh, effector to target ratio. So as you can see, there's, uh, after four hours under the spontaneous sample, there's still a lot of live uh, K562s that's in the sample. However, if you, you can see at 2 to 1, uh, most of the K562s uh, have lost their uh, calcium AM fluorescence due to the killing of the tumor cells. Um, because once the cells are killed, the uh, calcium AM would leave the, the cells and, and uh, minimizing the fluorescence. So we're able to use this to measure the cytotoxicity amount. So we're able to use this method to, uh, to look at uh, different patient-dependent killing results. So we have five uh, donors that donated uh, their uh, NK cells that was isolated from the PBMCs. Then we're able to uh, look at, at, uh, at two to one ETT ratio, 
they mostly have the uh, same amount of killing able to lyse all the, uh, all the uh, uh, tumor cells. However, as the ECT ratio decreases, you can see the difference starts to increase. Some donors have more uh, killing capacity versus others. So we're able to use the measured um, uh, live tumor cells to measure the percent specific license. So we were able to use all of these examples to show you that um, during isolation of cancer peptides, you can collect the cancer cells um, and then measure the till or the cancer cells itself to measure the concentration of viability. And you can also use uh, the solometer to measure cell count viability during viral vector development by looking at the uh, plating density uh, and as well as the uh, GRP expression to look at the transduction. Um, you can also look at the isolation and purification of PBMC and T cells to look at, again, concentration of viability. Um, look at the uh, using the fluorescence model to look at transduction and transfection of HEC293 cells looking at expansion of the T, uh, CAR T cells over time, measuring the concentration, and then finally using uh, the solometer to look at functionality testing of uh, um, direct cell-mediated cytotoxicity, uh, looking at the uh, K562 being killed by the NK cells. So that's what we have seen today, and uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, both Amy and I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tan. That was a great presentation. Um, like Leo said, we will be opening this time up for any questions any of our attendees have for us. So feel free to type those into the questions bar. Um, we'll have a couple minutes to, to take those in. Um, so while we're waiting for any questions that may come through, I just want to let all of our attendees know that they um, have the opportunity to submit any topics for webinars um, for the future. We'd be happy to take those. There's a little survey at the end of this webinar they can take for any comments or suggestions um, for future webinars as well. Okay, so we do have one question that came through. The question states, is it better to use fluorescence detection for all samples, or is it okay to mix it up between bright field and fluorescence? So um, that's a very good question. In general, uh, it is better to use fluorescence or one method to do all the samples. So it is better to just use the um, AOPI method to count all the samples. Um, however, uh, some of the samples uh, traditionally may have been done with uh, tripan blue or just bright field. So in order to uh, follow the same workflow as what you're currently doing, it may be better just to keep, um, keep the bright field for some samples and for more complex sample, then you can use fluorescence. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'm not really seeing any more questions come through. Um, so that will conclude our webinar for today. Um, but if you do think any of uh, if you do think of any more questions later on, uh, feel free to reach out to us via phone, or you can email us at support at nextlum.com or info at nextlum.com, and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions you may have. Um, again, uh, today the session was recorded, uh, so you will receive an email with the link to the recording uh, sometime today or tomorrow. Uh, and you can watch it again or pass it along to a friend or colleague if you wish to do so. Um, we will be having our next Thelometer informational webinar um, on May 3rd, so feel free to check that out and join us again. Um, again, thanks Dr. Chan for this wonderful presentation today, and I hope everyone has a great day. <laughs>